Okay. Let's see if I can play. No? Shouldn't play be over here? It's in slideshow. It's in slideshow. <laughs> this? Under, under right the slideshow. That? Yeah. Is that going to do it? Oh. <laughs> there we go. I told Sabrina this. I said there's going to end up, a picture of my cat will end up there. This happens every time I teach, and I want you to know that I removed that from my desktop three years ago. So the cat continues to haunt everything <laughs> that I do. Uh, so good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Jack Asher, the current mayor of the city of Emeryville. And along with Sabrina Landreth, our city manager, I'm going to be talking to you about the state of our city this evening. So we'll begin with some recent news. I was selected as mayor in December, and at that time, Ruth Atkin was selected as vice mayor. And your city continues to benefit from the hard work of Kurt Brinkman, Nora Davis, and Jennifer West as our fellow city council members. Uh, this year, we will be having an election in 2014. The city has moved to even year elections. The council did this by voting to extend terms by one year to 2014 and 2015. 16 and we did this because in part we were one of the few municipalities in the area that was still on odd year elections so we're really looking forward to increased voter turnout um, with the change to even years we can we continue to consider what's next after the elimination of redevelopment um, redevelopment was a financing mechanism that Emeryville used in order to build projects and attract development to our city and without redevelopment we need to think about how we will continue to build and improve our city infrastructure and um, projects going forward also in 2013, Pat O'Keefe retired, and Sabrina Landreth was hired by the city council to serve as the city manager. So this evening, um, while I'm going to provide a summary from each of the departments within the city, um, I'm, I'm going to take a particular focus, um, and I'll try to make it short. I'm used to speaking in an hour and 20 minute blocks. That's how long my classes are, so I can go on, but I will try not to do that. Um, what I want to do is I want to talk about the economic health of the city, but I, I want to couch it in a little bit of a different context. I, I want to spend some time linking that to uh, services and to the vision that I believe should be coupled with any discussion about economic health and future growth. So like I've said, the city changed, right, with the use of redevelopment. We've invested millions of dollars in improvements, and we need to have corresponding policies that are meant to draw people toward resources and draw people to our community. We talk quite a bit about attracting business in town, but we also need to attract and retain people that live here. And in particular, I think we need to work to keep those who are vulnerable close to resources. This includes the elderly, families and children, and people living below the poverty line. I want us, in short, to be a just city. And I'm going to focus on just a couple of areas in order to illustrate what I mean by this. So we're only 1.2 square miles, but we have a lot in our favor, right? We have urban density, we have our proximity to the bay, we have economic stability, and I believe that uh, we need to keep an eye on equity and justice. The good news is we already have the social infrastructure in place to ensure this kind of work in our city. What I'm calling for is expanding and strengthening it, especially as our city becomes less affordable for many people. And one thing that I want to mention, something that kind of operates in the background of what I'm asking for here, is what I'll simply call good government. In terms of what I mean by good government, I mean that our processes are transparent, we provide excellent services, your electeds and city staff are accessible, and the wider community is engaged in the government of the city of Emeryville. 
I'm very biased, but I believe we do well in all of these areas. We currently have 10 standing committees in the city of Emeryville, and there are 87 volunteers serving their community in this way. And I think this is a sign of what I would call a good government, right? And a government that has the ability to confront new challenges and work with new ideas. We have recently attracted new businesses and seen growth of the ones that are already here. Some of them are listed. We have Triple A out in the towers. The headquarters for Grocery Outlet is now located in Emeryville. We've had the remodel at Pack and Save, the expansion of Pete's Coffee, and then the opening of Uniqlo, which apparently brought lines around the block at, at Bay Street. Um, and this is good news. And when we consider new and expanded business, it's always coupled, for me, with how we are serving people who live and work here and how we can draw more people of all income levels toward the new resources that the city generates. So again, as we think about attracting businesses to town, we need these corresponding services that keep and attract people who live and work here. And the policies and vision behind both of these efforts need to be linked, and they need to be equally well-planned and well-funded. On the human services side, I feel this is crucial as Emeryville and the surrounding areas become less and less affordable to live in. We can, in effect, help with affordability in Emeryville. We can remove barriers to work and provide stability for people through the provision of services. We can make the city more affordable by enhancing and investing in programs that we've already established. We have decades of history behind these efforts, child care, before and after school, youth services, and affordable housing. I look at all of these as important factors in helping us to become a more just city. And let me start where I often do uh, with child care. And I talk about child care a lot, and I think that maybe people misinterpret this. They think that I do this because I'm a mother. Not exactly. They think that I do this um, maybe because I'm a woman. Um, and I think that this is an issue that disproportionately affects women. But I talk about child care because I need to work. Right. Um, many people in the Bay Area, with the increasing cost of living, must work. They must often have a double earner household to keep up with costs here. Moreover, parents have often invested years of training and education toward their jobs. Child care allows people to work. In the larger schemes, scheme of things, um, child care and funding for child care has been eroded. In the wake of the Great Recession, the state of California cut back on its subsidy for CalWORKs, which um, subsidizes, subsidizes child care for low-income families. Um, that cut was about 40%. And um, Emeryville enacted similar levels of cuts to our child development program um, in the wake of, of budget um, strains. So in terms of the state, there's talk of a partial restoration of these funds offered up in the latest state budget. But child care is a system that was underfunded long before to, um, 2009. And without reliable, affordable child care, parents face a barrier to work to school and to improving their, improving their skills. So even for families who consider themselves middle class, in almost every state in the US, the cost of preschool is on par with rent. And you can see this from the numbers that I've provided up here. That first number, 1184, is how much it would cost per month to have your four-year-old in daycare. 1627, um, that would be for an infant. And these are the resident rates, which have a kind of discount built into them at the Emeryville Child Development Center. So what you can see when you look at this is that if you have two kids, let's say, you'll be paying around $2,800 a month for the privilege of working outside the home and using your skills. It's a real crisis for the state's workforce. We're pushing and pricing parents and perhaps disproportionately women out of the workforce. I think we want families to stay in the city, I hope we do, and in our region, but we need to remember that daycare can price them out. We have a child development center that has been in our city for decades. We're one of the first facilities to offer infant care in Alameda County, and we need to put in place policies and funding that enable parents at all income levels to go to work. 
I'd like to see discussions of economic development coupled with discussions of the need for truly affordable childcare. The economy may be rebounding, but not for everyone, and we need these kinds of supports to reach a broader range of families. Within the city of Emeryville, we can take, it, take a look at our current level of service for youth and see that we actually have a lot of successes. So I just wanna highlight a few of these here. 84 infants, toddlers, and pre-K children receive daily care at the Emeryville Child Development Center. 21 out of 34 children who graduated from ECDC in August continued their education at Annie Yates Elementary School. And what that means with that graduating class of 34 children at ECDC, that it, they took up an entire kindergarten class over at Anna Yates. And that means those parents stayed connected to the city in some way. Um, and to me, that number is about the continuity and the building of community. We have 120 K through sixth grade children that attend the after school program daily. Again, if you go to work, you need after school care. And this is a 100% increase from last year. So that's a tremendous success. 35 children were able to persist to participate in the after school program with the implementation of a sliding scale fee. And we have more than 50 teens participating daily in the teen center programs and activities, and that's a 50% increase. So we are doing something right, and I hope that this is something that um, we can build on. Services to youth are important, and I want to point out that the title youth services or child care services, it's misleading. That while the services are geared toward the youngest members of our community, they have always an immediate multi-generational effect. To serve children is to serve at least one and possibly more adults. To have before and after school care, to have pre-K care, is to allow adults to work, to go to school, to participate in their community. And I think we should keep this in mind, this kind of multiplier effect, as we are considering what we are spending on these activities. Also within community services. In addition to providing um, services and care for the youngest members of our community, our senior center enjoys an excellent local reputation. It is very popular. There are over 14,000 visits recorded at the senior center, over 3,700 trips taken, um, over 3,000 meals on wheels delivered, and there's a large volunteer force that that helps with that. Over 3,000 rides were provided by our eight to go transportation um, service. And in fact, what I would like us to do is I would like us to consider what we do for our seniors in this community as a model for other segments of the community. We provide many housing options and a rich social network and supportive services for seniors. Um, moreover, living close to the Senior Center in the Triangle, I can also say that our Senior Center is an anchor for that neighborhood. It's a non-commercial building that enlivens uh, the neighborhood around it. So the Community Services Program um, continues to support early childhood education, enhance teen community involvement, um, develop and implement youth sports, and Gives, the sen gives seniors the opportunity to age in place and creates a sense of community through intergenerational programs and special okay. events. Okay, now from that, I'd like to turn to what I consider another um, element of affordability and one that certainly if you've picked up the newspaper recently <laughs> um, in the Bay Area, you've read about um, that there is an affordable housing crisis in the Bay Area. I serve on a regional body. It's the Housing Authority for Alameda County, HACA. And while HACA deals primarily with federally funded programs for affordable housing, it provides me with an understanding of how limited the funding opportunities yeah. are and have been for affordable housing. Uh, the current affordable housing crisis in our region has been a long time in the making and it's widespread. So with this in mind, what can we in Emeryville do to create a more to create more affordable housing and draw people from all income levels toward resources and community. Well, with the dissolution of redevelopment, 
things change. Um, the City Council did elect to retain the redevelopment agency's housing assets. However, without redevelopment, there's no ongoing tax increment to support affordable housing. And prior to the dissolution of the RDA, Emeryville received $6 million annually for affordable housing. So kind of keep that number in mind. $6 million annually that we no longer have. We need to as a city, have a discussion about what the loss of these funds means to our ability to serve lower income people and our ability to draw people toward resources and keep people of all income levels in our town. <clears throat> so there are policies that we have in order to guide our affordable housing program. And again, the question becomes, how are we going to pay for it, right? ABAG is a regional, um, body and one of the things that they do is they assign a fair share number of housing units for income levels um, to each municipality. They do this um, considering growth, right? And um, we can take a look at Emeryville's record around um, regional housing needs and our allocation. You can see here from 2006 to two. 2014, the percent achieved over in this last column, but it doesn't tell the whole story because Emeryville did much better than a lot of municipalities in building affordable units. But what it's telling us, right, is that we are falling short and everyone is falling short in meeting what is um, a demand and a tremendous need for low-income housing. And this need is going to grow. We can see in um, 2014 the percent change, right? They expect us to build even more very low income, low income, moderate income, above moderate income housing. Okay. What have we done so far? I mean, again, we have a good basis to work from. Um, we've built new affordable family-friendly housing developments, the ambassador housing um, units, that's 68 units of extremely low and very low um, housing. And we'll get a report in the coming months that'll let us know how many Emeryville residents and families served by our school were able to find a spot at the ambassador. Because as prices rise, people may not be able um, to keep up. This is something we'll be seeing in the city. You'll also see that both Am the Ambassador and 3706 San Pablo are developments that are extremely close to the 80 freeway. And um, this means that as a city, right, and as a just city, we need to make an effort to do what we can to improve livability in those areas for those families. Better, safer spaces, connections to West Oakland, and more greenery um, and walkability on this side of town is something that um, we should be <coughs> mindful of, that we have plans for um, as we bring families toward these new housing resources. And we've done a lot of work in order to bring people toward these resources in the past. This is what this slide shows us. You can see here that we've created housing with an eye toward non-traditionally abled populations at the Magnolia Terrace, at the Ambassador, and then also proposed at 3706 San Pablo. <clears throat> and we also have a goal to create a variety of housing types to meet diverse needs. Um, just as we want seniors to age in place in Emeryville, I would hope that we would also want people parenting young children to be able to do the same. Um, so I'm glad to see that um, we're working on family-friendly housing design guidelines. And in addition to these types of housing, I would also like us to think about perhaps uh, another co-op co or co-housing development. Uh, within our town, we can see that these developments have many people serving Emeryville through city committees, city events like Celebration of the Arts, the Planning Commission, the School Board, City Council, grassroots resident organizations, and perhaps active people self-select for this kind of housing type. <laughs> <laughs> that may be part of what's going on. Um, but I also believe that secure housing that is affordable gives people a base to work from. If they're not worried about the rising cost of rent, and if their housing situation is secure, you've removed a barrier to participation in the community. 
one more thing that um, I want to um, talk about. <clears throat> As the cost of housing increases, I think we may see more homelessness in our community. The city provides funds in support of the following, the Berkeley Food and Housing Project, um, the Alameda County Homeless Management Information System, and we also participate in Alameda County's Everyone Home Program. Um, and this is an issue that our city manager, Sabrina Landreth, is going to be working on with neighboring municipalities as well. Uh, now with this, I'm going to hand it over to Sabrina Landreth, our city manager, um, to step in to present on capital improvement program and the city finances. There we go. Um, so just really briefly, I wanna go through, as the mayor said, uh, a little bit about our budget and our capital improvement program. Those are usually cue words to folks at home to go take a restroom break. <laughs> but I do wanna urge you to, um, to pay attention to this. This is, you know, the city's budget is our key policy document that guides all of these programs that all of us care so dearly about. So the city has an operating budget of approximately $30 million. Um, that funds the majority of the city programs and services. The, uh, we also have a capital improvement budget, which is, um, funds our construction, major construction, and major maintenance. The pie chart there shows you in the current year what our general fund um, revenue, where it comes from. As you can see there, we have um, property tax that comes in at approximately just 6% of our total budget there. And in comparison to the one right below it, which is the card room tax, which brings in 8% of our city's revenue. I just wanna um, point that out to all of you, uh, just so that you can see the, uh, the order of magnitude. And where does our city, where does our money go? Well, this is our general fund budget. As you can see there, the majority um, goes to police and fire, which makes up 54% of our operating budget, um, which is not unlike most cities. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about our capital improvement program. And as we go through this, you'll see how this is a little bit of a different conversation than um, we have had in previous years. <laughs> Uh, our, our prior CIP, uh, it's a capital improvement program, was approved in December of 2006, and that covered us through fiscal year 2010-11. That program had an estimated cost, had projects in there that would cost $380 million. Only 200 of that was actually funded. As you can see right there, only 65 million of that was proposed to be funded out of the city's operating budget. Um, the rest of it, 144 million, was going to come from redevelopment. As you all know, that funding source no longer exists. Um, the average annual budget in that proposal was anywhere between 12 to 51 million dollars just for capital projects. This chart here shows you over the years uh, what was actually spent. Um, the green shows what was coming out of the city and the blue shows you redevelopment. So the most recent year that we have where that we show there is in 2011. As you can see redevelopment took up almost 100 percent of that. <laughs> The last time that the council reviewed a draft CIP was in January of 2011. Most of you are well aware of what happened in January of 2011. Um, we faced the sudden dissolution um, of redevelopment. That um, put any further action on that plan on hold um, pending um, resolution and shake out of that. Um, the city is in a place now where it is, has to develop new funding mechanisms. There's no more tax increment revenue. There's no more tax allocation bond financing. As you can see here, the city has historically every year put aside money to be used for at the end of the year to be put um, towards unfunded liabilities, and that included capital needs. So the city's been extremely prudent over the years. Um, for example, in March of 2013, there was 3.2 million that was set aside as a surplus. 
Uh, in addition to that, last June, the council adopted a policy on what are known as the boomerang funds, which are funds that are coming back to the city as part of the dissolution of redevelopment, uh, to set aside 75% of it into our capital improvement program, 25% for affordable housing, and 5% for economic development. So we've, so far in the um, last couple of years, we've set aside $7.6 million. Currently, city staff is in the process of developing the next five-year plan that will be coming to the city council and to the public over the course of the next um, six weeks or so at the various uh, committees. We'll be presenting our proposal for the next, as I said, the next five years with um, the first two years of appropriations. We'll be looking at everything from community facilities, parks, public art, affordable housing, bike ped, transportation and streets, and I can guarantee you there will be more projects in there than we have money for. Um, the, and then the draft CIP will come to you in the March-April time frame as part of the discussion of the, of the overall budget. We just wanted to show you there just order of magnitude um, what some of these projects that may that will come to you um, what the, the needs are just for our EOC or corporation yard alone we have an estimated cost of 6.8 million dollars again I want to uh, remember the slide that I showed you with the chart showing how much city dollars were going towards capital improvement over the years and I can tell you it was less than 6.8 million dollars um, we show up there just a few other programs or a few other projects that um, are, are substantial, that are necessary, that will be coming to you, uh, in addition to all of the, our annual programs that we fund, so our street rehabs, our sidewalk improvements, storm drain improvements, and sewer rehabs. And then little br uh, briefly, I just would like to touch on the city's debt. The city has only one long-term debt obligation. This is fantastic. Um, we recently refinanced this and were able to save about $1.3 million for the general fund. This debt um, continues until 2028. The majority of our debt, as you'll, you'll see in the next slide, uh, is actually from the former redevelopment agency and is being funded now out of um, those um, proper, the property tax revenues that are generated within those former redevelopment agency or re former redevelopment areas. This chart, as you can see here, we have approximately $162 million that is outstanding as of um, the end of last year that is attributed to the successor agency or former redevelopment agency, and just $4.7 million that is um, from the city. And this last chart here shows you just what we're paying on an annual basis to cover the debt payments and the expenses. The city is um, paying just $484,000 a year out of its general fund to cover that one um, outstanding issuance. And the successor agency um, is paying upwards of about $15 million. Again, these are funds that are coming from um, former redevelopment agency, or re former redevelopment areas. And as that debt is retired over time, then those dollars will be freed up and um, redistributed to the city and other taxing uh, entities. And with that, I'm going to give it back to the mayor who will cover the charter city. Thank you, Cindy. Okay, so um, looking at the need for affordability, looking at um, our very ambitious um, capital improvement project list, um, I want us to think about um, what we can do um, in the wake of the loss of redevelopment. One of the things that um, I've been thinking about, uh, gathering information about, is becoming a charter city. Currently, Emeryville is a general law city, and general law cities are governed by state law in matters of statewide as well as municipal affairs. Um, there are 121 charter cities in California, but more importantly for um, me and for this conversation, many of our neighbors are charter cities, including Alameda, Albany, Berkeley, Oakland, San Francisco, and Piedmont. 
So why would we adopt a charter city? I promise you it's connected to <laughs> our discussions about money. Um, charters are generally adopted by voters in cities to address issues, conditions, or needs that can't be met by state laws. Cities can adopt a charter to free themselves from requirements of some of the state's general laws pertaining to municipal affairs, such as limitations related to contracting. But with the recent elimination of redevelopment in the state, this has caused an increasing number of general law cities to consider becoming a charter city in order to take advantage of a charter city's ability to adopt a local property transfer tax subject to the Prop 218 requirements mandating voter approval. So even if we had voter approval um, to increase our property transfer tax, we can't we can't do that as a general law city. We could only do that as a charter city. <clears throat> so in order to capture this tax, a tax that the vast majority of municipalities around us use, we need to become a charter city. And again, here's that slide. 6% is what we get um, from property taxes. And our card room tax, right underneath it, at 8%. Um, OK. So. A city charter doesn't need to set out every municipal affair that the city would like to govern so long as the charter contains a declaration that the city intends to avail itself the full power provided by California Constitution and any city ordinance that regulates a municipal affair. What all of this means, right? What would have to change um, if we became a charter city? Well, that's for the citizens to decide, but we could actually change very little. We could maintain our city manager council form of government, um, but we would would have the ability to collect this resource and be on par um, with the region. Okay. So on this slide, um, <clears throat> right now we have a limit on the amount of documentary transfer tax that the city receives. And this is what is in this column, this really the third column, under Emeryville. Right, you can see how much documentary transfer tax we've collected from 2009 to 2014. So the average tax over six years there <laughs> has yielded $157,000. <clears> to the right of this, you can see that whereas we get um, 55 cents um, for every thousand square feet, I think it is, right? Um, because the county actually takes half. It's a dollar ten that is charged, but we just get half of that, so 55 cents. By comparison, these charter cities that are around us, Alameda can charge $12, Albany $11.50, Berkeley and Oakland $15, Hayward charges $4.50, Piedmont $13. San Leandro, $6. But you can see there the difference that it makes with the documentary transfer tax. And as part of um, a private real estate transaction, it's something that gets negotiated between the parties, right? Who is going to pay that tax? But you can see, for instance, if we charged, let's say, the rate of um, Alameda, because it's lower than Berkeley and Oakland. We always want to remain competitive here in Emeryville, right? So if we charge $12, that <clears throat> the average tax, right, um, the average possible tax would be over $3 million, right? So you can see that where we're earning 100000 these other municipalities are um, are getting millions of dollars from the documentary transfer tax. Right. So this is something um, that I want us to consider. I think that if we want to continue to maintain excellent services, if we want to continue to um, build, uh, this is a structural necessity. And it is something that helps us to keep pace with the municipalities around us. <clears throat> of course. One of the things that's been mentioned is that we can't predict, for instance, when large parcels um, will be sold or mergers will occur, but that's not the goal of a transfer tax, right? A transfer tax doesn't trigger sales, and I don't believe it would inhibit sales because so many of our neighbors have this exact same thing, right? So it's acknowledges that the sale of real estate, the turnover in real estate in Emeryville is not only about a discrete transaction between two parties. 
It's how the city keeps up, right, with renewal and change throughout the city. This is about affordability, about maintaining sidewalks, building more parks, providing services, and making sure that there is an evenness across our neighborhoods in Emeryville. So how would it happen? A charter could be adopted if a majority of voters approve of the charter in an election, right? Or the city council can draft or charge a charter commission to draft a city charter and place the proposed charter on the ballot on its own initiative. And the citizens group can also do this through an initiative. A city charter can only be amended by a majority of voters. Amendments can be proposed by the city council or by ballot initiative and can determine um, any municipal affair. So subsequent changes would um, require a vote by the citizens. So in looking at these issues of affordability, in looking at the loss of redevelopment, this is a solution, right? A way forward um, that I really like the council um, and the people of Emeryville to consider. I think it's time. With that, I want to turn from my emphasis upon affordability um, to highlights from our other excellent departments in the city. Emeryville continues to contract with Alameda County for fire services. Our Emeryville Police Department um, through November of 2013, part one crimes were down 3% compared to this same period last year. Robberies were down 27, burglaries down 21, and the increase was in the category of thefts. During the year, um, EPD has hired three new police officers and one new police service technician. They currently have three police officer openings. And I just want to say that when I'm out in the community, um, I hear consistent praise for our public safety um, departments. They're a real source of pride in the community. From the public works department, some of the things um, that we have to look forward to, I know uh, Vice Mayor Atkin is certainly looking forward to uh, the Joseph Emery skate spot, um, and construction for that will begin in summer of 2014. There's a senior center renovation. Again, we're gonna have a busy summer, summer of 2014. Sidewalk improvement program. Um, <clears throat> if we want to make sure that there's an evenness across neighborhoods, I think this is one way to do it, to make sure that all of our neighborhoods um, are walkable, even the old stock housing. The South Bayfront pedestrian bicycle bridge, um, <clears throat> right now, the, the plans and specifications are nearly complete. The project's been on hold due to funding issues created with the loss of RDA, which, as you can see, ripples throughout um, the city. Once funding is cleared for use, negotiations will resume with the railroad, approvals will be sought, and the easements will be acquired um, from adjacent property owners. <clears throat> The Public Works Corporation Yard and Emergency Operations Center is undergoing a renovation, um, <clears throat> and the project <laughs> will occur following an environmental remediation on the site. And then also, as was alluded to in the slides about the capital improvement program, uh, the Peninsula Fire Station will be renovated complete with tower clock <coughs> replacement. We're looking at a rehabilitation of um, ECDC, the Child Development Center, uh, that's scheduled for fiscal year 15 and 16. In terms of planning and building, we have recently completed projects, the Emory Station Greenway, <coughs> Ambassador Housing, Bakery Lofts 4, Parkside Apartments is under construction along with 64th and Christie and um, the pack and save renovations I don't think are complete yet, but <laughs> near there. Projects with planning approval and or in plan check, um, the Emeryville Center for Community Life, the joint use facility between the schools and the city, the Emory Station um, <coughs> West Transit Center, which we'll be uh, talking about this evening. 39th and Adeline, 3800 San Pablo, the Maz buildings, and the Shell gas station rebuild. You can see things are happening <laughs> in Emeryville, despite the loss 
of redevelopment building it continues to happen the public market um, phase 1b Hyatt Place Hotel at Bay Street um, are projects in the planning entitlement process along with um, the Nady site and 3706 San Pablo an affordable housing site <coughs> So again, this shows the Emeryville building permit valuation by year, and we can see that in fiscal year 12 and 13, right, this uptick that even with the elimination of redevelopment um, building happens. So the economy right now in several ways is looking up. Retail sales and hotel revenues are up. Office, vac office vacancy is down to 15.2% in Emeryville. Residential sales are up and um, prices are stabilizing. Unemployment is down to 6.1%. And the state has released um, some former redevelopment funds for our CIP project. And all of that good news, I think, is very good reason um, to think about a plan to draw people toward resources and to provide for more vulnerable populations in Emeryville. So I want a city for everyone. I'd like to increase affordability to working families through expansion of and subsidy for youth services, to work on increasing our affordable housing stock, and again, to draw people toward our resources and our community. Thank you. Okay.